So we'll give you a little background information first as we, as we go to talk about this, and then we'll get into the details of kind of where we're at uh, on its, uh, certainly its, its current availability and where, more importantly, where we're headed in the long term. Now, you know, from a timber perspective, I mentioned that it's historically, you know, of, of high value. There's lots of different products uh, that you can get out of one white oak tree, and I've just listed a, a, some of them here. Uh, the bottom part of a, a typical white oak saw timber size tree, let's say 18, 20, 22 inches in diameter, by the way, that might be uh, 80 to 120 years old. You get a lot of um, uh, veneer comes from that for furniture manufacturing. Uh, stave logs, so staves are the vertical pieces in a barrel. Um, so that's where our, our barrel logs and, and barrels come from is the bottom portion of that tree as well as high quality lumber. As you move up in the tree, you, there's other products that are cut from that tree, uh, railway ties, uh, things to make pallets out of, that kind of thing. And, and finally, pulpwood. Uh, some of uh, oak is used, white oak is used for uh, the small branches, chipping them up and using, making paper out of them. So there's a, a wide range of uses uh, for white oak from a timber perspective. And of course, value in that, you know, from, from a timber standpoint. Now it's also, and we'll be talking about this later in the show, uh, but white oak is highly valuable for wildlife, both from food, from an acorn or hard mass standpoint, as well as habitat. And we'll talk about more, and uh, Dr. Matt Springer will talk about that later in the program. And I should mention this too, that with all the interest these days in global warming and, and carbon credits for landowners and carbon sequestration, white oak is a great species to talk about that when you talk about uh, all, those, all those different um, interests and concerns, because it is a long life species, stays in the woods a long time. It can live up to two, three, four hundred years old and sequester carbon. And a lot of those products we make are long life wood products. So you sequester that carbon for a long period of time. So white oak can be a great player uh, in, in, in thinking about carbon sequestration as well. So the species is a winner for a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of different interests in it. So what I'm showing you now is just the range map of where white oak occurs. And so you can see it occurs all the way from, you know, down in the deep southeast uh, U.S. up through the lake states. However, the majority of the volume of, of white oak comes from the central part of that range, which Kentucky is right in that area. Ozarks, Missouri, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and that central Appalachian area. So that's where a lot of the white, the white oak comes from. Now, let's talk a little bit more in depth about white oak supply. Um, so what you're seeing here, of course, across the bottom of this is different age classes, the 10 year age classes. And you see that the highest bars there peak at like that 70 to 80 year uh, age classes in there. And, and the height of these bars represent how many millions of acres there are of white oak forests. So these are forests that have, you know, some type of white oak overstory in them, larger trees in them, you know, maybe uh, 20 or 30 percent at least of the overstory being, being in white oak. So we have a lot of acres of white oak forest, and that's why they're important for wildlife. That's why they're important for us to think about from a conservation standpoint and represents a sizable amount of a volume of timber that's out there for the industry. Now, you'll also notice, though, that if you're looking back to the left, there aren't a lot of acres coming on to ultimately replace this that are 10 years old or 20 years old or 30 years old, okay? So over time, what happens is this, this, this peak that you see that's in that 60, 80 year range, it goes to the right. So 10 years from now, this whole thing will shift to the right, 20 years it'll shift further, that kind of thing. And so what we're concerned about is there's not as many acres coming that are younger to be able to take its place ultimately. Now, there's, a, there's no needed need for, need for panic because look at, we're talking a lot of acres, millions of acres out there. They're in white oak forests that are continue to age. And because white oak luckily hangs around for a long time, it's not like all of a sudden those forests are gonna die off, they won't. However, you know, when you think about it uh, from the standpoint of taking 80 to 100 years to grow a white oak tree that's, that's a, that provides good habitats, you know, for roosting places for bats, right? Or wildlife, lots of acorns for wildlife or lots of volume for timber. You know, you have to be thinking about the replacement of those 80 and 120 year old forests now. You can't wait to get 10 years out and then think about it. 
Okay, so this gives you a little bit of information about the age of our white oak forests, which are aging, right? And what we're concerned about sustainability is long term, not 10 or 20 years from now, but 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 80 and 100 years from now. But in forestry terms, you have to think about that now. And one of the reasons we're concerned about that, and we're not seeing good replacement here of some of our forests, is because a lack of the reach, the natural regeneration of the species. So you have an oak forest that's in place now, and is it regenerating itself or not? Well, this was data, what you're seeing here in this map was data that was produced uh, by Dr. Lance Biggers, and, and, and uh, uh, he, was, he did this when he was at the University of Missouri. He's now at the University of Kentucky. He's one of our four or three professors here. And what this analysis shows is that, that how well white oak stands so, so we've got, a, we've got a, a forest, if you will, when I say stand, a forest that has a lot of white oak in the overstory now, a lot of larger white oak trees in it. Is it regenerating or not? What this map shows is the presence or absence of oak seedlings, because for oak to naturally regenerate, it has to develop seedlings underneath uh, an overstory of oak, right, that can advance and grow. We'll talk more about that. But the lighter the color here that you see, okay, the less oak regeneration there is under in existing oak forests. So some areas are pretty dark, like the Ozarks, for example. So the Ozarks, it's a little drier out there, and you see a lot more oak regeneration occurring in those forests, okay? As you move east and look at the difference in Kentucky, Western Kentucky, we have some areas that are doing pretty good, and some areas where that dark green or dark blue is starting to fade into lighter colors. And so what happens is, there's lots of areas where the, throughout the range of white oak where the 50% or less of those white oak stands have adequate regeneration in them. So this regeneration issue is one of the things that's causing us to worry about um, the long-term sustainability of white oak, okay? So let's talk about why that's occurring. Okay, if there's white oak forests there now, why aren't they regenerating? That's a really good question, okay? And, and so we're seeing this, um, it's less of a problem out in the western part of the region, out of the Ozarks, where it's a little drier and site quality is not as good. And White Oak likes that as less competition, right? But where we're really seeing our problems is are what we call medium high quality sites, ones that can produce, you know, a lot of timber growth, you know, a lot of biomass growth, if you will. And those happen to be uh, in the eastern part of the range, okay? So to regenerate the oak forest, as I mentioned earlier, there must be seedlings present. So you have an overstory of oak, drops acorns on the ground, and this little picture here, of course, is a naturally developing white oak seedling in those stands, okay? And those seedlings must not only start, and those acorns must not only germinate and start to grow small seedlings, but those small seedlings must be able to get bigger, okay, over time. So they can ultimately replace the, the larger oak trees as they die or use or harvested or, or whatever, okay? And so the oak forests that we have now were a result of or established in, in the 1800s, late 1800s and 1900s, okay? And the conditions that created our current oak forest really aren't, aren't there anymore. And we'll explain that. And that's what's causing some of this disconnect between there being a lot of oak forests now without many regenerating adequately at this point. It's because of the conditions that were present when our forest started back in the 1800s, 1900s, you know, compared to what's going on now. So what I've got is a timeline up here, and then I just ran it back to 1700, if you will. This is a conceptual timeline. And, and back then, you see all the pictures there. Those were pictures that were taken, you know, obviously in black and white because they were taken at the, the you know, in the, in the 1800s, turn of the century, that kind of thing. We do have one colored picture there that shows that forest fire on the far, on the far right hand side bottom there, which is fairly recent. Okay, but the conditions that were going on back in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, where we had uh, the tanneries that where they were using oak to strip bark from to tan leather, um, they were. Uh, there was a picture of an iron furnace there, so uh, a lot of our oak, a lot of our upland forests were being used for fuel for iron furnaces. And so fire was a constant on the landscape back then. Um, you know, our First Nation tribes used 
Um, and, you know, people use fire as a tool. So there was a lot of burning that went on back then. And what happened is it created more open canopies and the thin bark species that were competitors for oaks and oak seedlings, they were kind of pushed off the landscape. So think in thin bark species, think in terms of maples and beech, okay? And so a lot of those species were, were pushed out of our upland forest because of the way we used land back then. Pretty abusive. Well, oak likes that, okay? So what happened over time though, uh, Smokey the Bear happens, uh, we start suppressing forest fires, they're not burning everywhere, you know, and that's gonna continue. We're never gonna start large scale burning again of the forest like we had then. And what happened over time is, we all of a sudden now those beech and maple, those thin bark competitors, they moved back into these forests. So the conditions that, that, that are present now and what we're doing with the land now is far different than it was in the 1700s, 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s when our oak forest established. And that's why we've got so many oak forests now and why we're having trouble retaining them, okay? All right, so let's talk about current use for just a little bit because while we said, yeah, we're not, we're not grazing hogs in the forest anymore, we're not burning randomly, you know, those kind of things. Um, what are we doing? Well, we're building subdivisions in them for starters. Right? We do those kind of things. So you got urban sprawl that happens, okay? Um, but you also have use for, for timber harvesting, and that's the pictures that I have up there now. And so what I wanted to show you was, was a, another little map here, and you can see the different colors, um, you know, red, yellow, and green, if you will. Um, and what, these, what this is, is represents, uh, red represents areas that were removing more white oak than were growing. Okay, you notice this is, the, this is the range map again of white oak. So the little red air, areas show us places where we are removing, which means it could be timber harvesting or it could be, uh, you know, expansion, you know, um, urban sprawl and those kind of things. But we're taking land out of, we're removing more white oak than we're growing. The areas that are uh, in, in a color uh, like that yellow or green are areas where we're growing that we're removing. So what happens here is we've got a matrix, if you will, of current land use, I uh, mean current use of our forest where we're losing some white oak in place and we're gaining, okay? All right, and I will mention this. There is more demand for what we call higher quality white oak trees, those that can be used for uh, higher valued products that need like uh, wood with no branches in them, um, you know, or no knots in them, all right? That would be like for veneer. Uh, to make a barrel, you can't have knots in it, so you have to have nice clean wood or higher valued logs and trees out there, and for high quality lumber, it's the same thing. So there's a lot more pressure on our higher quality, and a lot of those areas that are in red right there are, are showing reductions in are white oak because of the demand for the higher quality products, okay? All right, so we kind of know all this, all right? All this biology that's going on, the use that's going on. So what's our response to that? Well, um, we develop what's called the White Oak Initiative. We're gonna talk a little bit about that and give you some information on it. And this initiative started, this region-wide uh, interest in White Oak, uh, uh, causes a uh, white oak initiative start, and it was really driven from the awareness of, of, of white oak dependent industries on what's going on with their white oak supply. Okay, and so let me give you a little history of how this all this awareness and the formation of the white oak initiative from this awareness occurred. Okay, and so um, a little bit on how the initiative started. Well, to try to get information, we did this as part of you know, University of Kentucky Forestry Extension, where I ran uh, two sustainability conferences, one in 2015 and one in 2017. Uh, and we ran these one day conferences on white oak sustainability. And we had present over a hundred in both sessions of forest industry, those that were dependent, either solely dependent, like cooperages and state mills and stuff that went into uh, bourbon produ uh, bur barrel production uh, for our, largely for our bourbon industry um, and other white oak industries, you know, that used uh, other industries that use white oak, like flooring, for example, uh, cabinetry, those kind of things. We had distillers were present, uh, agencies like Kentucky Division of Forestry was there, U.S. Forest Service, those kind of, and conservation groups like uh, Nature Conservancy and others that are concerned about, uh, and wildlife groups um, that were concerned about 
about our white oak uh, availability and sustainability. So we ran these two conferences. And, and when everybody that was there saw what was going on with the white oak, we presented a lot of data and that kind of thing. Okay, there was interest in developing some type of partnership or something that we could do as a group uh, so, so we could start to deal with the sustainability issue. So um, everybody that was present, uh, particularly in that 2017 meeting said, yeah, we need to do something, we need to form a partnership. And it was from that that we, uh, we developed this idea or concept for a White Oak Initiative. And this, was, this concept was developed by us here at the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And myself was a big part of that. Um, and, and then the American Forest Foundation. Some of you may, may know them, uh, because this is who runs uh, the American tree farm system, for example. So American Forest Foundation, its president, myself, got together along with um, individuals at Brown Foreman, uh, obviously interested in, in bourbon production and white oak availability. And we basically formed this white oak initiative. Okay. So the white oak initiative is a collaboration to deal with white oak sustainability. Okay. And, and the interest is, there's broad interest in this, as you might expect, given what White Oak is used for and that kind of thing, okay? And you can see there a number of initial partners that came together to form this initiative. There's a, a lot of logos there, of course. Some of these are distillers, Brown Foreman, you may, may recognize, Sazerac, Independent Stave Company, the top uh, right-hand logo. That's the largest producers of barrel in the world, barrels in the world, and their, their company is, is is headquartered and was founded in Missouri. It has plants here in Kentucky, that kind of thing. Beam Centauri, those kind of things. There's agencies there, U.S. Forest Service, um, you know, state agencies, um, forest industry, all that kind of thing. So you can see the wide range of interest there was in, in, in forming this initiative. So what I'm gonna do now is we've got about a, a two or two and a half minute video that we're gonna have Billy run here and that's just about the formation of this initiative. A lot of different people, for a lot of different reasons, care about our white oak forests. Numbers right now are showing that growing stock of younger oaks is declining. That causes a long-term sustainability concern. Because it's a slowly evolving issue, it's hard to bring often attention to it because it's not something that just happens overnight. Because if it takes 50 or 80 or 100 years to grow this, you have to think about it now. We've got a lot of middle-aged to older-aged forests. What's missing is a lot of the younger. 40 to 50 years from now, we may have a tightening of supply. That would really hurt a lot of industry. There's a demand for higher quality white oak, for, for barrel production, for veneer, for lumber production, all those kind of things. The challenge is, is, is landowners being aware of good management practices, loggers being aware of good logging practices. That's what the White Oak Initiative is trying to address. Part of what the White Oak Initiative is doing is taking all of this wide variety of organizations coming together to say, how do we teach farmers, either private or public, to grow or maintain their forest? What we do is step in and give them a leg up. As a result of that, allow the White Oak to compete, grow larger, faster, and regenerate the site. Once we have adequate reproduction on the ground, then we can start thinking about our harvest. To fix long-term forestry issues like we have here, it takes collaboration. We're often working with clients on a multi-generational basis. The oak regeneration that we've seen today, my grandchildren may end up harvesting that. When land is forest land is managed well, it produces benefits not only to the owner of that land, but it produces benefits far beyond those boundaries that benefit the public at large. This is where we get clean water from. This is where we get wildlife habitat. If we want to have all those things 50, 100 years from now, you have to manage this resource. So by being foresightful and looking ahead, we now can enjoy the things that we so value from oak for us. Okay, so 
so I think that that video did a pretty good job of um, kind of uh, talking about what Oak, what the White Oak Initiative is. Okay, um, what it has done since it's uh, since it was formed, and we've got roughly we've got a couple million dollars that have gone into this. And what I've, I've put up on the screen right now are just different um, different action items, different things that the White Oak Initiative is starting to produce. Uh, we developed a White Oak Assessment and Conservation Plan, which outlines, uh, which outlines where we need to be thinking about doing White Oak management um, in, you know, here in the Eastern US and, and what needs to be done to improve White Oak sustainability. Uh, we developed management guidelines and landowner resources for, uh, for identifying oaks and managing oaks. Uh, we're in the process of COVID set us back on this, but developing regional workshops, trainings, and online trainings uh, for foresters, landowners, and loggers, all those that are involved in, in what happens and goes on in, in the forest. And uh, we're even dealing with things like policies, uh, you know, po federal policy that, in, that makes sure that we're encouraging white oak. For example, is there money in the farm bill for forestry practices and that kind of thing? Um, so the initiative is involved in a lot of those things. And finally, uh, supporting, not from a dollar standpoint, but providing um, you know, uh, uh, support, written support for and encouragement uh, uh, for uh, research on, on white oak. And so there's a lot of action that, that's going on here. If you want to get more uh, information on this, go to uh, whiteoakinitiative.org, where you can find some of these publications I've talked about and the videos there and that kind of thing. 